Wish, chapter 14. Wishbone didn't like that collar one bit. He bucked like a bronco when I put it on him, flinging his head this way and that. Then he sat down and dug his feet in like a mule when I pulled on the rope to get him up out of the trap. But after leaving a trail of baloney, like Hansel and Gretel's breadcrumbs, I managed to get him to follow me, step by step, to the house. Once we were inside, Bertha locked the screen door and I untied the rope. Then we sat on the sofa and watched him. He sniffed everything that was worth sniffing in that house. The shaggy green rug by the front door, Gus's easy chair, Bertha's basket of yarn. Then he made his way cautiously through the rest of the house, inspecting the coat rack by the back door, licking crumbs off the linoleum floor under the kitchen table. When he spied one of the cats up on the windowsill, he let out a bark. The cat arched his back and hissed. I was relieved when Wishbone just walked away. Bertha had been worried that he was going to chase the cats. And I have to admit, I had worried about that a little too. After a while, he got tired of sniffing and laid down next to the sofa and went to sleep. I tiptoed over and sat beside him, stroking his fur and whispering his name. I couldn't hardly believe that I had my very own dog. When Gus got home that night, he seemed pleased as punch to see Wishbone sitting there in the kitchen while Bertha cooked chicken fried steak and black-eyed peas. Well, don't that beat all, he said. I couldn't keep my hands off of Wishbone. I petted his head and stroked his ears and scratched his belly. Isn't he something, I said. Gus nodded. He sure is. He smells like something, too, Bertha said, making a face. You're going to have to give him a good bath out in the yard tomorrow. I, I will. Tomorrow was Saturday, so I had all day to spend with him. I'd bathe him and walk him. Maybe I'd teach him a trick, like to sit or lay down. I might even take him to Howard's house if I decided not to be mad at him anymore for calling me a quitter and a baby. And then I remembered calling him a squirrel-eating hillbilly with Mrs. Odom standing right there on the porch. My stomach squeezed up and my face burned just thinking about that. I knew Howard wouldn't be mad because that was his way, but I bet Mrs. Odom hated me now. I bet she wouldn't want me in her house messing up their goodness with my hateful words. That night, I took Wishbone out on the porch with us. Every now and then, he perked his ears up at the sound of a rabbit or something rustling down in the woods. But eventually, he laid down and rested his chin right on top of my foot. He didn't even pay any mind to the cat strolling around him. I think you got yourself a good one, Charlie, Gus said. I smiled down at Wishbone. I'll bet he'll be as good as Skeeter, I said. Gus nodded. I bet he will. You know what I like best about dogs, Bertha said. Gus and I waited. They love you no matter what, Bertha smiled down at Wishbone. Shoot, I know folks who are cranky or stuck up or bull-faced liars, and their dogs love them like they're saints or something. Know what I mean? Gus nodded and said, yep. I hate to admit it. Bertha went on, but I bet half these cats of mine would run off and never look back if somebody came along with a can of sardines. I leaned down and ran my hand down Wishbone's side. His fur was soft and warm, and he snored real soft while he slept. Then I gazed up at the starry sky and had a feeling I hadn't had in a long time. Thankful. I felt thankful that I had my very own dog, who would love me, no matter what. When I woke up the next morning, the first thing I did was look for Wishbone to make sure I hadn't just dreamed he was mine. Sure enough, there he was, curled up on the floor beside me. I'd put one of my pillows there for him, and he hadn't wasted one minute flapping, flopping down on it. I spent the morning bathing him and combing him and picking burrs out of his tail and ticks off of his ears, I knew he didn't like it much, but he let me do it. 
When I was done, he looked so handsome and smelled so good that Bertha kept making a fuss over him and running back into the house to get him another chicken liver. He was so skinny, you could count his ribs right through his fur. We need to fatten him up, Bertha said. After lunch, I practiced walking him with the rope tied to his collar. At first, he'd made it clear that he didn't like it. He'd jerk his head this way and that, or sit down and refuse to budge. But I kept a plastic bag full of tiny pieces of cheese and bacon and stuff to lure him along. And after a while, he was trotting right beside me. Around the yard, through the garden, up the driveway, and back. I let him take a nap tied up in the shade of the big oak tree on the steep slope by the back porch. Bertha brought a tablecloth outside and spread it on the ground next to him. Then the two of us had pimento cheese sandwiches and sweet tea for lunch. Bertha told me a story about some old man named Cooter who used to be the mayor of Colby. He carried a gun, she said, and if anybody parked in front of town hall where they weren't supposed to, he'd shoot their tires out. Really? Really? And his wife used to wash her underpants and hang them on the antenna of her car and then drive around town till they were dry. I wrinkled my nose and said, Ew! Bertha laughed. I know! That big old underwear looked like the national flag of the land of big behinds flapping in the breeze like that. Me and Bertha had a good laugh over that. Every now and then, Wishbone's feet jerked and he let out a little yip while he slept. I wondered if he was dreaming about running free again without a rope tied to him. I hope not. I took a gulp of sweet tea and watched the honeybees flitting over the clover beside us. Clover. Maybe I could find a four-leaf clover. So while Bertha told me about how Cooter and his wife bought a gold mine in Nevada and moved away, I searched and searched. Sure enough, I found one, but I didn't pick it. If you pick it, it will bring you good luck. But if you leave it growing there, you can make a wish, which is exactly what I did. After lunch, I decided I wasn't mad at Howard anymore, so I tied Wishbone's rope leash to the handlebars of Lenny's bike and pedaled down the road to the Odoms. Wishbone seemed to love that, racing along beside me with his ears flapping and his tongue hanging out. When I got to Howard's, he and Dwight and Cotton were in the front yard playing some game that involved throwing tin cans and punching each other. Hey, y'all, I called. Look what I got. They raced over and gathered around Wishbone, stroking his back and patting his head. Wow, Charlie, Howard said. You did it. I couldn't stop myself from beaming at him. I know, I said. And isn't it great? Isn't he great? Howard scratched behind Wishbone's ears. Looks like he's got some beagle in him, he said. I like his ears. While the Odom boys made a fuss over him, Wishbone sat there with his eyes closed and a doggy smile on his face. We played with him the whole afternoon. Cotton kept tossing popcorn for him to catch, and Dwight led him across the yard on the leash and got him to jump up into onto an old cooler and sit. Howard even taught him to shake hands in no time flat. Oh, he's smart, Howard said, and we all nodded in agreement. Let's show Mama his tricks, Howard said, hurrying to the porch in his up-down way. With everybody making such a fuss about Wishbone, I'd forgotten what I'd said yesterday when my scrappy temper had grabbed hold of me. But when Mrs. Odom came out to the yard to see Wishbone, I remembered. My face burned and I couldn't even look at her. Howard showed her how Wishbone could sit on the cooler and shake hands. Ain't he smart, he said. Oh, he is smart for sure, Mrs. Odom said, and lucky he sat, found such a fine friend as Charlie. I felt relief wash over me. Maybe Mrs. Odom wasn't mad at me after all. Let's get some treats and teach him to roll over, Howard said. That's a good idea, Mrs. Odom ruffled my hair. 
I've got some squirrel pie fresh out of the oven. I wanted to sink right into the ground when she said that or disappear into thin air. Poof! Gone! But of course I couldn't. So I just stood there with my face burning and my stomach in a knot. Dwight and Cotton hooted and hollered, slapping their knees and saying, Squirrel pie! Mrs. Odom put her arm around my shoulder, and when I got up my courage to look at her, she winked at me. I'm so glad to have a feisty female around here to help me keep these boys under control. I've been needing a girl on my team. On her team? Mrs. Odom needed me on her team? I wished I could have saved that moment there in that weed-filled yard, surrounded by those good-hearted Odoms, with wishbones sitting there on the cooler in front of us. Just pack it into one of Bertha's canning jars to keep in my room. Then, when I was feeling bad about myself or loaded down with all my troubles, I could open it up and breathe in the goodness of it, and I'd feel better. But the moment passed, and Howard brought a piece of chicken out to the yard and we tried to teach Wishbone to roll over, but all he wanted to do was eat that chicken. Back in Raleigh, we've got a fence around our yard, so he can run free back there, I said. Howard's smile faded, and he said, Do, do you think your mama will let you keep him? Shoot! I wish he hadn't said that because it stirred my worries up and I'd been doing such a good job of keeping them locked in tight. The truth of the matter was there was no telling what Mama would think about me showing up back there with Wishbone. But I managed to push that worry away and say, Sure she will. She's going to love him. When are you leaving? Howard said in a tiny, quivery voice. I shrugged. I don't know, I said. Soon, I bet. But I knew in my heart that Mama still didn't have her feet on the ground. I mean, I hadn't even gotten so much as a postcard or a phone call from her since I'd been in Colby. I knew she was still laying around in her bathrobe in the dark, drinking diet soda for supper and not thinking about me one tiny bit. Howard got quiet after that. So I finally tied Wishbone to the bike and headed back up to Gus and Bertha's. When I got there, Gus was sitting at the kitchen table while Bertha sliced green peppers from the garden and jabbered about that fancy new drugstore they were building out on, on Route 20, uh, building out on Route 26. Well, there they are, Gus said when he saw me and Wishbone, a girl and her dog. Then he reached in his pocket and pulled out something that he held out to me in, in his palm. A little bone-shaped dog tag with wishbone engraved on it. He turned it over and showed me it had a phone number on the other side. Gus, Bertha squealed, you are a prince. She kissed his cheek. Ain't he a prince, Charlie? I nodded. Then I might be a king when you take a look at that. Gus said, nodding toward the coat rack by the back door. Hanging there with the raincoats and cardigans was a red dog leash. I figured he needed a real leash instead of that old rope, Gus said. Bertha kissed him again. Now you are a king, she said. Ain't he charming? I just couldn't get over Gus going and doing such a nice thing for me. Yes, ma'am, I agreed. He is. Then, Gus took Wishbone's collar off, attached the little tag to it, and put it back on. When I looked down at him with his collar on and his very own tag with his very own name, he seemed like he'd been mine forever, like he belonged right here with me, not astray anymore. And in the middle of that happy moment, I had a tiny seed of a thought that I hurried to push out of my mind before it had time to grow. That thought was this, where in the world do I belong?